Hi everyone. In the last video, we talked about balls and bins. A nice way to analyze many balls and bins problems is via the Poisson distribution and a technique called Poissonization. So that's what we're going to talk about in this video. For any non-negative parameter lambda, we can define the Poisson distribution with parameter lambda by its probability mass function as follows. If x is a Poisson random variable with parameter lambda, then the probability that x is equal to k for any positive integer k is equal to e to the minus lambda times lambda to the k all divided by k factorial. That might look like a pretty strange expression if you haven't seen it before, but we'll see why it's really nice soon. But first, to give you a sense of what this distribution looks like, here I've plotted the Poisson distribution for various values of lambda. So here's lambda equals 5, lambda equals 10, lambda equals 15, and lambda equals 25. You can see that as lambda gets larger, the distribution kind of gets smushed to the right. If these curves look kind of familiar, there's a reason. The reason is that another way to define a Poisson random variable is as the limit of a binomial distribution. That is, imagine that we flip n coins, which are heads with probability lambda over n. The number of heads we get is a binomial random variable. It's distributed as a binomial random variable with parameters lambda over n, the probability of heads, and n, the number of coins we flip. We can also define the Poisson distribution with parameter lambda as the limit, as n goes to infinity, of this particular binomial distribution. So to illustrate this, here I've plotted the Poisson distribution and the corresponding binomial distribution. You can see these are not exactly the same, but as n gets larger, here n is 50, uh, these are going to get closer and closer. Okay, so why are these two definitions the same? Why is it the case that a random variable with probability mass function this thing is equal to the limit of a random variable with probability mass function this thing? This is the probability mass function for a binomial random variable as n goes to infinity. Well, let's do some quick hand-waving to see why. First, using Stirling's approximation, n choose k here is morally e times n divided by k to the k. Similarly, 1 minus lambda over n here is morally e to the minus lambda over n. Simplifying then, we get that this expression is e over k to the k times lambda to the k times e to the minus lambda 1 minus k over n. Here I cancelled some n to the k's, and I divided by n in the exponent here. Now we can simplify a little bit more. By Stirling's approximation again, e over k to the k is morally 1 over k factorial, and 1 minus k over n is morally 1, since n is going to infinity, so this e to the minus lambda times 1 minus k over n is morally e to the minus lambda. So now altogether, so now altogether, this whole thing is e to the minus lambda times lambda to the k, all divided by k factorial. But hey, that's exactly the same expression that we had over here, the probability mass function of a Poisson random variable with parameter lambda. So that explains both why these two distributions are the same, and also hopefully motivates this particular expression. Here are a few nice properties of Poisson random variables. It's a good exercise to try to verify these. We might do some of them in class and or on homework. So first, suppose that x is a Poisson random variable with parameter lambda. Then the expected value of x is equal to the variance of x, which is equal to lambda. Second, if x and y are independent Poisson random variables with parameters lambda 1 and lambda 2, respectively, then their sum x plus y is also a Poisson random variable with parameter lambda 1 plus lambda 2. And third, Poisson random variables are really nicely concentrated around their expectation. In particular, if x is a Poisson random variable with parameter lambda, then, as we saw above, its expectation is lambda, and the probability that x deviates from its expectation by more than some parameter c, greater than zero, is at most 2 times e to the stuff, where as c gets large, this stuff is roughly like minus c. Thus, for large enough c, the probability that x deviates from its expectation by more than c is exponentially decreasing in c. Okay, so why should we care about Poisson random variables? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but one reason, which we mentioned earlier, is that Poisson random variables are a nice way to analyze balls and bins. 
So let's see why. Recall that when we discussed balls and bins before, we were just dropping n balls into m bins at random. Frequently in these problems, we care about the occupancies of each bin, that is, how many balls land in each bin. And an awkward fact is that the occupancy of, say, bin 1, the number of balls in bin 1, is not independent from the number of balls in bin 2. For example, uh, if there are lots of balls in bin 2, then maybe I think there's going to be fewer balls in bin 1. So these are not independent, and that sometimes gets in the way when trying to analyze things. So instead of studying that problem, let's study a different problem. I'm still going to consider dropping balls into bins, but now the number of balls is going to be random. More precisely, let's drop k balls into m bins, where k is a Poisson random variable with parameter n. By the concentration result we saw before, we're probably going to be dropping close to n balls, but maybe a little bit more or a little bit fewer. The reason to do this is that a few nice things happen. First, the number of balls in any given bin is also a Poisson random variable with parameter n divided by m. This parameter at least makes sense because we expect n divided by m balls in each of the m bins if we were just dropping n balls into m bins. Moreover, the occupancies of all the bins are now independent random variables. This is great, and it makes them much easier to analyze. We'll see a few ways to make use of this later, but first, let's just prove these statements, that the number of balls in each bin is a Poisson random variable, and that they're all independent. For simplicity, I'm going to assume that there are just two bins. The case for m bins is basically the same. Okay, so let x1 and x2 be the number of balls in bins 1 and 2, respectively. So we want to show that x1 and x2 are independent Poisson random variables, each with parameter n over 2. First, let's consider the probability that x1 is equal to i and x2 is equal to j for any fixed i and j. So I claim that this is equal to the following product, the probability that a Poisson random variable with parameter n over 2 is equal to i times the probability that a Poisson random variable with parameter n over 2 is equal to j. So let's compute this. First, the probability that x1 is equal to i and x2 is equal to j is equal to the probability that k, the total number of balls dropped, is equal to i plus j, times the probability that a binomial random variable with parameters i plus j and 1 half is equal to i. That is, this is the probability that i plus j is the correct number of balls to be dropping, and this is the probability that i of them land in the first bin. Given that i of them land in the first bin, and there are i plus j of them total, that means that j of them are going to land in the second bin. So now we can just write out what this is. From the definition of a Poisson random variable, this first probability is e to the minus n times n to the i plus j divided by i plus j factorial. The second probability, which is just the probability that we get i heads when we flip i plus j fair coins, is equal to i plus j, choose i, times 1 half to the i plus j. Now we can simplify slash unsimplify this as follows. So first, for reasons that will become clear in a moment, I'm going to write this e to the minus n as e to the minus n over 2 times e to the minus n over 2. Then I'll write the next n to the i plus j as n to the i times n to the j. And now if I were to write out the definition of this binomial coefficient, I would notice that there's going to be an i plus j factorial that is going to cancel with that one, and what I'm going to be left with is a 1 over i factorial times 1 over j factorial. And finally, I'll write this 1 half to the i plus j as 1 half to the i times 1 half to the j. But now we see two Poisson probabilities sitting here. Here's the first, and the second is the remaining terms. So this is just equal to the probability that a Poisson random variable with parameter n over 2 is equal to i times the probability that a Poisson random variable is equal to j. Hooray, so this proves the claim. With that claim proved, I'm next going to show that the probability that x1 is equal to i is indeed the probability that a Poisson random variable with parameter n over 2 is equal to i, and that a similar thing is true for x2. So we can write the probability that x1 equals i as the sum over all j of the probability that x1 equals i and x2 equals j. But by claim 1, this is the sum over j of the probability 
that a Poisson random variable with parameter n over 2 is equal to i times the probability that a Poisson random variable with parameter n over 2 is equal to j. And now we can think about pulling this sum inside, and we see that summing this thing over j is just going to be equal to 1. So altogether, this is just the probability that a Poisson random variable with parameter n over 2 is equal to i, which is what we wanted to show. Check. And a similar thing shows that the probability that x2 is equal to j is also the probability that a Poisson random variable with parameter n over 2 is equal to j. So now we're almost done. This claim here showed that x1, the number of balls in bin 1, is indeed distributed as a Poisson random variable with parameter n over 2, and now we just need to show this last claim that x1 and x2 are independent. But we've already shown this, because the previous two claims say that the probability that x1 is equal to i and x2 is equal to j is just equal to the product of their probabilities. Probability that x1 is equal to i times the probability that x2 is equal to j. So they're independent as well. Hooray! So this shows, at least for the special case of m equals 2, that indeed the occupancies of bin 1 and bin 2 are themselves Poisson random variables, and they are independent. And it's a good exercise to try to generalize this to more than two bins. So this result gives us a clean way to analyze balls and bins problems called Poissonization. So suppose we care about this balls and bins problem where we're dropping n balls into m bins. What we'll actually analyze is this Poissonized version of the problem where instead of dropping n balls into m bins, we're going to drop k balls into m bins where k is a Poisson random variable with parameter n. In this case, as we saw before, the analysis is going to be slightly easier, hopefully, because all of the bin occupancies are independent. Finally, we'll de-Poissonize to draw conclusions about the original problem that we care about. Usually this follows since k is really tightly concentrated about n. For an example of Poissonization, let's look at the coupon collector's problem, which we've discussed before. Recall that we get a random one of n types of coupons in each box of cereal, and we want to know how many boxes we have to buy before collecting all n coupons. So before, we saw that the expected value of the number of boxes we need to open is n log n plus o of n. Now we're going to use Poissonization to compute the probability that the number of boxes deviates from n log n by too much. More precisely, we're going to show that for any possibly negative constant c, as n goes to infinity, the probability that x is bigger than n log n plus c times n tends to this expression, 1 minus e to the minus e to the minus c. To get a sense of what that means, here's a plot of 1 minus e to the minus e to the minus c. This plot shows that, for example, the probability that x is greater than or equal to n log n minus 5n, that's this point here, is basically 1, while the probability that x is greater than or equal to n log n plus 5n that's this point here, is basically zero. So this shows that x is pretty tightly concentrated around n log n. So to prove this claim, we're going to use this notion of Poissonization. We can view the coupon collector's problem as a balls and bins question. If I throw n log n plus c times n balls into n bins, what's the probability that all of the bins get hit? So here, bins are standing in for coupons, and balls are standing in for cereal box. So we can analyze this in two steps. The first step, is to study this Poissonized version of the problem. So we're going to draw a random variable k, which is Poisson with parameter n log n plus cn, and we're going to ask, what's the probability that I see all of the coupons after opening k serial boxes? We're going to show that as n goes to infinity, this probability tends to exactly what we wanted, 1 minus e to the minus e to the minus c. The second step is to depoissonize and translate our results from over here back to over here to show that the answer to the problem that we care about is the same as the answer to the Poissonized problem. More precisely, we'll show that the probability that we see every type of coupon after n log n plus cn boxes is more or less the same as the probability that we see every type of coupon after k boxes, where k is this Poisson random variable. Steps 1 and 2 together will imply that the probability of seeing every type of coupon after n log n plus c n serial boxes, or equivalently the probability that every bin is hit after that many balls, 
converges to this expression, 1 minus e to the minus e to the minus c, as n tends to infinity. And that will prove the claim. Okay, so let's start with step one, which is to look at the Poissonized, or Poissonified, which I find more fun to say, version of the problem. We open k boxes, where k is a Poisson random variable with parameter n log n plus cn. By the result we saw earlier, the number of coupons that we get of each type is a Poisson random variable with parameter log n plus c. So now the probability that we see all the coupons is just 1 minus the probability that a Poisson random variable with parameter log n plus c is equal to 0 raised to the n. That's because this is the probability that we see a particular coupon, and then we get to raise it to the n because thanks to the Poissonization they're all independent. Now using the fact that the probability that a Poisson random variable with parameter lambda is equal to 0 is e to the minus lambda, this just follows from the definition of the Poisson distribution, we see that this is equal to 1 minus e to the minus log n plus c, all raised to the n, which simplifying is equal to 1 minus e to the minus c divided by n raised to the n, which tends to e to the minus e to the minus c as n goes to infinity. And this is true because 1 minus 1 over x to the x goes to 1 over e as x goes to infinity. So this implies the thing we wanted to show in step 1, namely that as n goes to infinity, the probability that we see every type of coupon after k boxes is 1 minus e to the minus e to the minus c. Okay, so now we go on to step 2, the depoissonizing or depoissonifying step. Remember here the goal is to show that the probability that we see every type of coupon after n log n plus cn boxes is roughly the same as the probability that we see every type of coupon after k boxes, where k is this Poisson random variable. To see this, we're first going to show that for any b, the probability that we see all of the coupons after b boxes is more or less the same, plus or minus some little o of one term, as the probability that we see all the coupons after b plus or minus n to the 0 0.9 boxes. So that is, a few more or a few fewer boxes is not really going to make a difference in the probability that we see all the coupons. Next, we'll show the second thing, which says that the probability that k, the number of boxes we open in the Poissonized version, is very, very close to the number of boxes that we open in the original version. In particular, the probability that this deviation is bigger than n to the 0 0.9 is going to be teeny tiny, some little o of one term. Together, thing a and b are going to imply what we wanted to show for this step 2, since we can plug in n log n plus cn for b up here, and then we can conclude what we wanted. Okay, so let's prove these two things. First, let's do thing a. So let x be the number of boxes needed to get all the coupons. So let's consider two events. The first is the event that x is greater than or equal to b minus n to the 0 0.9. The second is the event that x is greater than or equal to b plus n to the 0 0.9. So I've drawn these events as nested because they are. If I see all of the coupons after b minus n to the 0 0.9 serial boxes, then I have still seen all of the coupons later after b plus n to the 0 0.9 boxes. So this event is a subset of this event. And what is this stuff in between? What's, what's the difference between these two events? Well, this is the event that we needed those remaining 2 times n to the 0 0.9 boxes to find the last coupon. So this is the event that we find the last coupon somewhere in boxes b minus n to the 0 0.9 plus 1 up to b plus n to the 0 0.9. So now looking at this picture, we can write the probability that x is greater than or equal to b plus n to the 0 0.9. Well, this is equal to the probability that x is greater than or equal to b minus n to the 0 0.9 plus the probability of this strange donut event. I'm calling it a donut event because I've drawn it looking like a donut, not because it actually has anything to do with donuts. I guess it also looks like a bagel. I don't know, these are open questions. Anyway, this probability is at most the probability that x is greater than or equal to b minus n to the 0 0.9 plus 2 times n to the 0 0.9 divided by n. Where here I've bounded the probability of this donut event by 2 times n to the 0 0.9 divided by n because there's one particular coupon that I'm hunting for out of n, 
the probability that I find it in 2 times n to the 0 0.9 additional serial boxes is just this ratio, 2 times n to the 0 0.9 divided by n. But fortunately, 0 0.9 is less than 1, so this whole thing is the probability that x is bigger than b minus n to the 0 0.9 plus some little o of one term. So why did we do all this? Well, remember what we wanted to show. We wanted to show that the probability that we see all the coupons after b boxes, that is the probability that x is greater than or equal to b, is more or less equal to the probability of these two events we just considered. But the event that we see all of the coupons after b boxes is sandwiched somewhere in here. So then what we've shown is that this probability is sandwiched in between two things whose probabilities only differ by little o of 1, and that proves claim A. Check. So now we can move on to part B. Here we just want to bound the probability that k, the number of boxes we end up opening, minus its expectation is more than n to the 0 0.9. For this we can use the tail bound for Poisson random variables that we conveniently saw before. So I'll leave it as an exercise to the viewer to go back and look at that tail bound and try to apply it in this situation and verify that indeed you get that the probability that k deviates from its expectation by this much is tiny, little o of 1. So I'll just put a check mark there and say that this follows from our earlier tail bound. Okay, so that finishes both step 1 and step 2 of our plan, and as we talked about before, that finally proves this theorem. That is, as n goes to infinity, the number of serial boxes you need to open until you get all n coupons is pretty close to n log n. Finally, we come back to our example from the earlier video on balls and bins, maximum load. Recall that last time we saw this proposition. With high probability, the maximum load when I drop n balls into n bins is at most 3 log n divided by log log n for large enough n. Now we're going to use Poissonization to show that this bound is pretty tight. More precisely, we're going to show that there exists some constant c, so that with high probability, the maximum load is at least c log n divided by log log n for large enough n. So again, we're going to have two steps, Poissonify and depoissonify. First, let's do the Poissonification step. So let's study the Poissonized version of our problem. So as before, instead of tossing n balls into n bins, we're going to toss k balls into n bins where k is a Poisson random variable with parameter n over 2. Notice that k here is probably going to be close to n over 2 rather than close to n. In particular, it's probably going to be less than n. That'll be okay for what we're trying to show, since what we're trying to show is that the maximum load is large after we drop n balls. But if we can show that it's already large after dropping about n over 2 balls, then that'll be enough and we'll be done. So that's why we're going to choose the parameter to be n over 2 here. Okay, so let's choose k like this and toss k balls into n bins. So then, by the theorem that we saw before, each bin load is going to be independent and distributed as a Poisson random variable with parameter 1 half. Now we're going to bound the probability that the max load after dropping k balls is greater than or equal to c log n over log log n. So for notational sanity, let b equal c log n divided by log log n, and let's consider the probability that there is no bin with load greater than or equal to b. Well, this is at least the probability that there is no bin with load exactly b, and using the definition of a Poisson random variable and the fact that the bin loads are independent, this is equal to 1 minus e to the minus 1 half times 1 over 2 to the b divided by b factorial, all raised to the n. Okay, this looks a little bit gross, and it will look even grosser when we plug in the definition of b, but let's analyze this expression here. So I'll do it up here in the corner. So this expression is 1 over the square root of e times 1 over 2 to the b times b factorial. Now using Stirling's approximation, this is x of minus b log b plus b plus some big O of log b term. So far all of this is just handling the b factorial in the denominator. Then minus a b natural log of 2 for the 2 to the b term and minus a 1 half for the 1 over root e term. So now substituting in our definition of b here, we see that this is equal to x of minus c log n divided by log log n times the log of c log n divided by log log n plus some stuff. If you want, you can write out what this stuff is, but I'm just sort of writing it as stuff here because this stuff is going to be little o of this leading term here. So eventually I'm going to ignore it. So now let's analyze this leading term here. 
the leading term in this log of c log n divided by log log n is going to be a log log n, which cancels with this log log n. And so the whole thing is going to be x of minus c log n plus stuff, where again, this stuff here is little o of c log n. Altogether, this whole expression is going to be big omega of n to the minus c. So I was a little fast and loose there with the stuffs and the big o's and the little o's, but if you don't believe me, you should do it out and, and make sure that this is legit. If you do believe me, that's cool too. Okay, so returning to this expression, this is all going to be equal to one minus omega of n to the minus c to the n. And oh no, I've just realized that this inequality is going the wrong way. So if you noticed that a while back and have been yelling at your screen for this entire time, good job. Uh, let me fix that. Sorry about that. And now carrying on with our inequality in the correct direction, we can bound this by e to the minus big omega of n divided by n to the c, which is little o of 1 if we choose c less than 1. And remember, in the theorem statement, we got to choose c whenever we wanted, so let's go ahead and choose c less than 1. Okay, so we've just bounded the probability that there is no bin with load greater than c log n divided by log log n. What we wanted to bound originally was the opposite, the probability that there is some bin, the maximum load bin, with load greater than or equal to c log n divided by log log n after tossing k balls into n bins. And so this is going to be greater than or equal to 1 minus what we got before, which is 1 minus little o of 1. So this shows that if we had k balls, this random variable k, instead of n balls, then the maximum load is probably big. So this was the Poissonized version. So the next step is to de-Poissonize and show that this distinction doesn't really matter. This leads us to step two, de-Poissonification. So what we're going to show is that with high probability k, the number of balls we dropped in the Poissonified version, or the Poissonized version, is at most n. If we can do that, then that will imply that this probability, the probability that the maximum load is large after we drop n balls, is at least this probability, the probability that the maximum load is large after dropping k balls. This follows because if we're going to drop more balls, the maximum load is not going to get any smaller. But we've already showed that this second probability is at least 1 minus little o of 1, and so all of this together will prove the statement that we want to show. So let's wrap up by showing this, that with high probability, k is less than or equal to n. So we have the probability that k is less than or equal to n. Remember that k is a Poisson random variable with parameter n over 2. So that means that this is at most the probability that k deviates from its expectation, which is n over 2, by more than n over 2. So at this point, we could use the fancy tail bound that we saw earlier, but actually Chebyshev's inequality will be just fine here, so let's do that. So Chebyshev's inequality says that this is at most the variance of k divided by n over 2 squared. But we saw from our useful facts from the beginning of this video that the variance of k is just n over 2. So this is n over 2 divided by n squared over 4, which is little o of 1. So that proves this statement, which then implies this statement, which is what we were trying to show. Okay, so that just about wraps it up for this video. So to quickly recap, first, Poisson random variables are nice, and it's especially nice to drop a Poisson number of balls into bins. Second, Poissonization is a useful technique where we use Poisson random variables to approximate the thing we actually want to study. And we saw two examples of this. First, we used this to prove a sharp threshold for coupon collecting, and second, we used it to prove a matching lower bound on the maximum load, which matches the upper bound we saw in a previous video. Okay, so that's all for now. Thanks for watching.